All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for Youth Advocacy Training Session 1. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. We're going to wait for everybody to join us uh, for just a minute, and then we'll get started. But I want to, again, thank all of you for joining us today and thank all of our lovely speakers for the day. We have Claudia, Olivia, and Doralyn, as well as our facilitator, Bailey. Um, and I think it's going to be a great session. So I hope you are all having a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, wherever in the world you are. Um, if you would like to introduce yourself in the chat, we would love to hear where you're from, um, how old you are, your interests in conservation. Um, go ahead and introduce yourselves in the chat, um, and then we'll get started in just a minute. <clears throat> Laura, we need like a, like a Spotify, like advocacy training playlist. We do. So that, honestly, so you're so right. Waiting. We could just, <laughs> you know, listen to Jack Johnson. Um, we can listen to, um, other ocean warriors. Yes. <laughs> like, um, um, a Calancho. Right. Um, yes. Deep cut reference there to you. <laughs> another cut. Ocean Project program from early COVID times. Uh, but on that note, uh, let's get started. Thank you guys so much for um, introducing yourselves in the chat. You can go ahead. Thank you, Shadia, Gotham, um, Kyla, Willie, Yasmin. Oh, so many people. This is so exciting. Um, but here is our schedule for today. We're just going to run through our introductions, and then we have three separate presentations for the hour, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end so that you guys can um, ask questions. Feel free as we're going through the presentations to add your questions to the Q&A feature, um, and then we have a couple of announcements at the end. Um, but I wanted to start by introducing myself. My name is Laura Johnson. I am 25 years old, and I am the youth program supervisor for the Ocean Project. I'm also the uh, lead program coordinator for advocacy training. So all of the emails that you've been getting uh, reminding you to register for this program have been coming from me, so I apologize for spamming your inbox. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to email me at youth at theoceanproject.org. Um, now I want to introduce our lovely session facilitator, one of my very dear friends, one of my own environmental heroes, um, Bailey Ritter, and she will be uh, introducing our presentations today. Thank you so much, Laura. First of all, I'm just beyond stoked to be here with you all today. Um, I'm so lucky that I get to continue this work. I worked for the Ocean Project for nearly four or five years um, before transitioning to my own advocacy work uh, full-time in my community. Um, and I was so fortunate to be in the position that Laura now is and does so beautifully as the youth initiative coordinator. Um, but now I'm an advisor and I get to do like the most fun stuff, uh, which includes being with all of you today. Y'all are from all over. This is so cool. I mean, like a maritime lawyer, like what? Okay, pop off. Um, thank you so much for spending your Saturday with us, um, no matter where you're coming to us from. Um, the fact that you are showing up and showing out just gives me so much hope and so much optimism um, for the future and, and where we're heading. Um, a little bit about me. I'm from Pontiac, Illinois. You'll hear from some Illinois uh, eco warriors in a little bit. Um, but my work really has focused on providing entry points for young people like yourselves to get involved no matter what that looks like. And I was able to do that with the Ocean Project and I now am able to do that with an organization um, that I'm the founder and director of called Everyone's Collective. But most importantly, I think I wanted to start off by talking about what a really full circle moment this is and empowering each of you that sometimes the first step is having conversations. So when I was a part of the Ocean Project, um, it was sort of the beginnings of talking about 30 by 30, um, specifically um, uh, talking about ocean conservation and, and the protection of our ocean. 
And it was the first time I'd ever heard of that. And the first time I'd ever heard of that goal, I actually was so fortunate um, to hear Dr. Enrique Sala talk about it for one of the first times in person at the AZA conference in 2019. And I was so struck by it. Um, this idea of protecting 30% of our planet by 2030 as that being a really ambitious goal, but a really doable goal um, from a, you know, a science perspective that I went home and I talked to my dad who is an environmental science teacher in my hometown. And we just were having this conversation of what can we do? Everyday people, science teachers, you know, educators, um, directors, founders, young people, what, what, what can we do to achieve this goal as it's gonna take all of us to make that happen. And so in those conversations, we chatted with his students, which are on here um, today and gonna be presenting next about their work we talked to them, what do you guys think we should do? What, what are first steps? What are things that everybody can do? And really that's what this conversation is all about. And we're so fortunate to have Claudia as well with us talking about the work that she does in, in, her, in um, her community in Puerto Rico. You know, it's really ambitious, this, this goal 30 by 30, um, but all of us together, collective action is what we need to make it happen. And all of you here today, take from these conversations what makes sense to you you know something that either three are, are talking about you know steps that they took things that they did make sense run with it take it in your community start there um there's so many ways to get involved and get started it's just about finding what makes sense to you building a community of people around you to make it happen and then seeing it through and overcoming barriers which all three will talk about a little bit so to start off, I really wanted to take a look at, you know, things that you can be doing right in your own backyard, right? 30 by 30, protecting entire states. Yeah, maybe not possible um, right here, right now. But what are some things you can do to protect your own backyard um, that don't involve actually, you know, buying pieces of land and saying, this is protected now and it's towards the goal. You know, what are some small things that you could do? So I wanted to introduce Olivia and Doralyn first, um, who are gonna be talking about ways that you can get involved um, in your own backyard. Their backyard is Illinois here in the United States, um, but we come from a rural agricultural community and the solution that they found um, to adding and, and adding to 30 by 30 is really something that can be replicated all over. So turning it over now to Olivia, who's gonna get us started. Hi, Bailey. Thank you so much. Um, like she said, my name is Olivia Schickel. I am a um, freshman at Illinois State University, but I originally came from uh, Pontiac Township High School. So I'm going to share my screen if that's okay and get started with the presentation. Uh, let me find... Do, 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 do. Okay. Can everybody see that? Am I good? Awesome. Okay. So like I said, my name is Olivia Schickel. Um, I worked on the um, Illinois 30 by 30 Conservation Task Force um, during 2021 and into 2022. Um, and this was a very, very special project for me. And um, I kind of just fell into it. And that's a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today. So um, it's really important to me that I acknowledge the um, people that brought me into this, the fact that um, no conservation project exists in a vacuum. So um, the students in Mr. Ritter's class, who you can see on the screen, who most of them were inspired by Bailey, actually, um, they kind of started this project. They are the ones that started identifying this problem of Illinois is actually an incredibly diverse um, state in terms of plant and animal species. And you don't see it because so much of the Illinois identity when it comes to nature is based on um, the agricultural side and agriculture um, is not the most diverse. You're taking one crop and spreading it all over the state. So, and as a state that um, produces so much towards the agricultural economy, we had a very, very tricky um, issue to navigate. So that was um, very difficult, but we also knew that that meant that if we can bring 30 by 30 to Illinois, we can bring 30 by 30 to any state. This is probably the hardest place to introduce this um, this initiative. So 
these students wrote, lobbied for, and passed House Bill 3928 in the Illinois General Assembly, which formed this formal task force. So um, this bill was um, very important. And what was very interesting is that um, we had guidance from legislators, we had these connections, but really it was made in a high school classroom um, with a couple students at a desk. This is, you didn't have people with degrees, you didn't have all that, it was us and we wanted to carry out a vision and that vision was protecting our state. And um, what I kind of wanna share with, with that with you all is um, you don't, need to be afraid of your abilities as a student just because you're young. I think that that narrative is kind of spreading, which is really, really special. But um, just know that like, if you don't spend so much time worrying about whether other people are going to believe in you, um, you're going to be better off. My first day on the project was summer of 2021. And I was invited to a meeting with the UN, um, which had been organized, which was very crazy. And I was sitting there um, watching um, Emily Collins speak and I was freaking out. I was like, I can't do this. I'm not ready for this. And then I realized it clicked then and I never had to think about it again was you don't have time to worry about this because you have to do it whether you like it or not. The world doesn't have time to wait for you. So you have to step up and do it yourself. Um, and if I can do it and I'm not that special, every single person in this call can do it. So think about that um, as, as you go off and want to bring these into your community. All, honestly, this project was, was sitting down in front of a computer and typing. And then we were able to do something incredible with it. So keep that in mind. Um, this is a little bit more about the bill. So what we were able to do was um, we included um, a very diverse group of experts and legislators um, into this bill, including um, students and educators. Um, and the idea was that we were all going to get together and um, have these information sessions, collecting in, um, information from experts, collecting data. And also what was really important for us um, in relation to our problem was collecting data on what the people of Illinois wanted. Um, in a state where the idea of 30 by 30 comes down to the government stealing our land, that's really difficult because if we don't start off on the right foot, nothing we were going to do was going to touch anyone. It wasn't going to have the impact we wanted to. So we had to be very, very careful. We had to be, and, and not politicize what we were doing. Um, so we just met people where they were and we wanted to know what they legitimately thought and what they thought they needed. And um, this was very enlightening for us. And we realized that there was a lot more land that we, and water that could be conserved that we were just not using, um, you know, to the best of our ability. Illinois has only, I think, three percent of our land is conserved, and we were going to have to make up. We have to make up twenty-seven percent, but we can make up that land in smaller ways. Um, we talked about this so many times. Was um, next to highways. There's so much area there. We just had to find those spaces. Um, and that was a lot of what we talked about was meshing this issue of we don't have a lot of conserved land. We have people who don't realize that they want to conserve that land because they are fearful of it and trying to um, find that solution, which was meeting people where they were and letting them grow with the facts, not necessarily with their beliefs and understanding that um, we are all in this together because it, it just had gotten very politicized. So we had quite a few goals that we had set out. Um, one characteristic of the bill that we wrote is we took a lot of the language from um, a document called um, Conserving and Protecting America the Beautiful um, 2021, which was put out by the Department of the Interior. So we took a lot of that language. In case you need somewhere to start, if you wanna do something like this, that is a great place. Um, and a little secret about um, writing laws or writing any documentation that really touches people in their hearts is look at other great documents. Um, most people, it's not plagiarizing if you you know read it through and it inspires what you do. So that's where a lot of our touch points came from. The first, we wanted to include indigenous groups connected to Illinois. 
unfortunately, this didn't really manifest during my time there, but um, any environmental justice generally is going to come, especially in the U.S. with the connection to Indigenous people. Unfortunately, Illinois does not have any um, land that is um, reserved for Indigenous communities. It's very unfortunate. Um, so we were trying to bring them into the fold as best we could. The next, which I had talked about a little bit previously, was coming at everything from a collaboration perspective rather than trying to push an idea. I also talked about that gathering data to include holistically all of Illinois citizens. And interestingly enough, we um, we gathered some data on students as well. We did st some student surveys that we sent out across Illinois to Illinois schools. Because um, as students, we are going to be the ones inheriting this land. So it's only fair that our perspective is included in the, the discussion as well. Finally, um, we presented our final recommendations after we collected all this data and after we had our meetings um, as a document um, for the Illinois General Assembly to review. So now they have a touch point for any environmental um, decision making that they make in the future. So um, I want to just open it up to Bailey and just um, see what if there's anywhere else you want me to um, take this, what what you think. No, that's perfect. Um, I think what Olivia, you did really awesome is, Olivia's an example. So this project is about three years in the making um, and it takes a while, guys. So <laughs> like it does, like hard, consistent, collaborative work takes a really long time. Um, but so this is the foundation, right? These are the beginning, the conversations, the the research. This is the the foundation. And so what Dora Lynn is now going to speak on is that next step, that next iteration. Okay, once we have the foundation, once we know what's happening in our backyard, once we've identified not only the problem and the solution, how can we take that to the next level? And that's what I want to invite Dora Lynn to speak on uh, now. Thank you, Bailey. Hello. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, my name is Dora Lynn Lee. I am a senior at Pontiac Township High School this year. And the way that I was brought into the 30 by 30 initiative was um, my junior year when Olivia was still going to Pontiac, she and I became really close. And she would talk to me about all of these things that were going on in Mr. Ritter's environmental earth science class. And one of the things that she mentioned most often was the 30 by 30 initiative. And she told me about all the things that she had gotten accomplished and everything that she was doing with her team. And I thought that it was very interesting because it is for a good cause. And it seemed so out of this world to me because she was working like with legal jargon, something that I'd never really dabbled with her understood so I just I thought that it was really cool so she had already explained how the, it began in Illinois and I took on the initiative me and my team this year took on the initiative in Mr. Ritter's class and what we started with was we took the legislation that we had written that Olivia had already written for Illinois and we took it and we said okay it is not enough for people to listen if we just have it in this one area it's a good and it's a wonderful accomplishment, but for people to see it as this is happening, we need to expand further. So we decided to expand uh, and hopefully get it recognized on a federal level. So this year um, we have a new group of students focusing on expanding the legislation state by state. And we began with Michigan because of its strong ties to indigenous tribes and culture. <laughs> Is that yes? Okay. Yeah. Um, no, perfect. That, that's great. No, thank you so much for sharing. Can Dorlin, can you speak a little to what it's like? Um, you've actually been able to connect and um, collaborate with um, uh, the Odawa tribe. What has that been like? What has that experience been like? Not only, you know, accomplishing that one goal and really bringing indigenous voices, um, indigenous um, American voices and whose land this is actually we're protecting. What has that experience been like? And um, also speaking to um, how, 
have you integrated um, the things that you know they care about, their traditions, um, into um, the the task force um, initiatives and goals? Mm -hmm. Olivia, could you go to the the next slide, please? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so for this project, we had really wanted to put a big focus on incorporating Native voices because it is so important for us to consider the ideas and the opinions that they have um, because they come from a variety of backgrounds. And we have to prioritize this because in the 30 by 30 legislation, it will be affected, it will be affecting a vast amount of land. And we have to acknowledge that it's where the land came from and that it originally belonged to them. And we are doing this for uh, people of Native American descent to help protect that land that belonged to them. So um, in October, we invited our, a team of tribal leaders and individuals of the Odawa tribe, uh, Kristen Berry, Gail Christensen, and Anthony Davis. And we invited them to um, Pontiac in October. And we were able to make meaningful connections with them and gain an understanding of their visions for the initiative. And uh, they helped us, we introduced them to the initiative and then they introduced some aspects of their culture to the students at PTHS. And we got to talking with them and we developed a starting point for the plan for where the 30 by 30 legislation was going to go in Michigan. So could you go to the next slide? <laughs> Thank you. So after we met with them in October, we have had consistent meetings with them over the last year. And we talked to them and we have edited the legislation and they have added what they think they see fit for Michigan. And they have, um, we've really tweaked with the Illinois legislation to change it and modify it for Michigan. And as we have expanded, it has been important to establish ties with senators in Michigan, such as uh, we have spoken with Senator Sue Schenck and her chief of staff, Sydney Hart, and they have helped us. Um, they have read through the legislation that we have written for Michigan, and they have said that um, it. they have seen like where some things could be changed or some things that they would like to change, some things that are really good, things like that. And we are hoping to pass it hopefully by June of this year. And we've altered the legislation to make sure that the, the native voices are heard in Michigan as we have tried in Illinois. And the biggest challenge that we have faced is meeting the deadlines for the legislative calendar that Sydney Hart and Senator Sue Schenck have, because it's going to be very difficult to work around that. So we have tried to get meetings in, we have spoken with them, we have we have continued to speak with our team, and we're just really optimistic that it will pass by the end of, or by June of this year. And hopefully we'll be able to make an even bigger difference on a larger scale nationwide after that. Do you have another one more slide? <laughs> I do not. <laughs> okay, all done. Oh my gosh. Thank you guys both so much. I think um, really connecting it to the fact that what Olivia said, this was, this was in a classroom. This is friends chatting about what we could do, looking up existing language around 30 by 30. What are countries, what are communities similar to the ones you're operating in? What are they doing? Um, can you do something as easy as a task force? you know, ensuring that your communities, your cities, your governments are meeting about this issue um, and that you have student representatives, you have native voices um, who are communicating and sharing their values. It's all things that you guys can do in your own backyards. Um, transitioning backyards, you know, Olivia and Dora Lynn talked about the agricultural communities and, and sort of rural community that we come from. Transitioning to our next speaker, Claudia, whose backyard maybe looks more similarly to some of yours watching. Unfortunately, I wish our backyard looked like the backyard in Puerto Rico. Um, sadly, it does not, but hey, that's perfect because we have awesome advocates like Claudia um, doing the work, protecting her community and including and incorporating education where she can. That was the, the thing about Claudia's story that really stuck out to me is how this has been 
similarly to Olivia and Dorlin, a progression, right? It started out with Claudia protecting the mangroves and educating people about protecting mangroves and educating about coral reefs to now actually having an area where those things are protected. Like what? So cool. So I don't want to steal her thunder. Um, and I want to turn it over to Claudia to share a little bit about her story and talk about her experience with the 30 by 30 initiative. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for being here. We are so excited to have you all here. Um, my name is Claudia Muñoz. I am a marine biology student from the University of Puerto Rico at Umacao, and I am currently collaborating with organizations, local organizations like Surf Rider Foundation, um, to make all of this come together and to do a special project that I'm going to be talking more ahead about. Um, and yeah, um, some of, of some of the pictures that you saw before, no, don't worry, <laughs> are some of the work that I've done um, by giving people workshops um, about coral reefs, mangroves, um, taking it to schools, universities. And these are some examples of, of things that you as young people can do to collaborate with this um, initiative. Um, so recently, my most recent experience was doing an amazing fellowship with Earth Echo called um, 30 by 30 by Ocean Echo. And they helped me create my own campaign and um, to get to that 30 by 30 goal, starting from Puerto Rico, my home. And these are some of the goals that were reached or wanted to be reached. Um, over 6,000 people were reached through so, so social media of our partners that were Surf Rider. Um, Surf Rider is a environmental um, organization that's focused on all types of coastal conservation. And also six, about 60 people were directly impacted and species were given about marine protection and why it's important to reach that 30 by 30 goal. And we also got to create an infographic so that it could be installed in the area that um, it's going to be soon, a marine protected area. And so many people reached out about this project, excited to be part of it. And yeah. So for the campaign, these are some of the things that were um, driven. And the first picture is something that's very um, impactful. Um, we had a small group of fellow young marine biologists that joined me and helped me to create an inventory of species that live in the Bay of Aguadilla. And why did why did we do this? Um, so we the importance of inventories and census of species is so that people can get the understanding of why is why is this area so important? Why is, is this ecology so important? So we wanted to do that research so that when we showcase it to people they can get a better understanding of, hey, these beautiful species live here and we have to conservate them. So we, aside from that, we also educated people about our findings and get, got them to collaborate with us. And it was really an amazing project. Um, so this is the Bay of Aguadilla, the beautiful Bay of Aguadilla. In the left, we can see a picture of the um, the limitation of this area, that um, this will be the soon to be marine, marine protected area um, in yellow. And um, this uh, on the right, we can see some of the reasons why we need to protect it. So the brown pelican um, has um, one of the main areas of nesting of this species is in the area of Aguadilla the area of Bay of Aguadilla. And also so many beautiful coral reefs and sponges live in this area. So these are just some of the species that live here and why is it important to protect this area? So not only that, but why do we need to protect this? Well, some human activity has been going on for many years in this area. Um, we can see the deforestation of mangroves and native plants um, 
in this area. And it's very worrying because not only do we take away that nesting area for the pelicans and other migratory birds, but they also took away um, the protection from erosion. And so this area is um, in top of a cavern uh, of a cave. Um, and this is making that the sediments that we can see on the right picture percolate and reach the water. And this is affecting all of our fauna and our wildlife in the area. The brown pelican coral reefs are getting suffocated by these sediments. So it's very, very important, important that young people like us and any community member that want to get involved take action. And that's what we've been doing. Um, here is just a picture of many, many that are around circulating about the sedimentation. Um, these waters are usually crystal clear, blue waters, beautiful waters. And because of that human activity, um, they're brown. And even though sedimentation is a natural process, this is um, aggravating it and accelerating it too much. And most of the reefs in this area are dead by now. So we just saw the problems, but how can you get involved? As a young person myself, I was thinking of, um, I'm a passionate person for the environment, but what can I do to help out? So I just started emailing, emailing a lot of organizations, um, following a lot of organizations on social media, um, searching for their emails, because um, you never know what they might respond to you. So I just came out as, hey, I wanna volunteer with you guys. And I was very excited to volunteer. And some of them um, reached out to me as well and told me, hey, we have this opportunity, we have this. Um, so you never know if you might get a job or a volunteering experience or how could you help out? So I think that not many people talk about this way of reaching out, but it's very important to know that with just an email, you can get across um, so many great opportunities. Um, and that's my case. Um, I emailed Surfrider Foundation and they gave me the opportunity to be a volunteer with them. And they kept inviting me to so many great activities. And um, eventually they um, got me in the position of coordinating activities with them and helping them out with so many things. And that's how I found about the Earth Echo Fellowship and the 30, 30, 30 by 30 initiative was through just a single email. So I encourage you all to do something and take action if you're so passionate about what you love and the environment. Um, so aside from that, um, you can start from home by following all your organizations, support your organizations because you never know what help or what needs they may have. Um, as a community, we, we can have, and as young people, we can have such a big impact um, so just heard, um, different platforms, for example, Earth Echo has a platform. It's kind of a social media that's called Gen C, and they post their opportunities of um, different volunteering or internships. And so that's a great resource to be used and also to network, um, get out there in those um, opportunities of volunteering and or other experiences you never know who you might meet. So do go out um, and get the chance to get some networking done. And so about the marine protected area in Puerto Rico, um, currently there's um, some research being done by the fellow marine biology students, other professors of marine biology, professors um, that specialize in birds, um, and they're all working together to get to the different sectors of the community because we want to create a new marine protected area led by the community. So as you can see, um, the community by itself um, and us as young people can have such a great impact um, by just being part of it. Um, so the different sectors of the community, want um, we want to reunite them so that we can all come across with an agreement of how we want to manage this new marine protected area not just um, be focused on the scientists or students, um, but involve everyone, even um, simple members of the community who want to be part of the change of uh, 
to protect this area, people who just um, want to take care of this area. So thanks to all of these efforts and thanks for the community to um, their efforts in protecting this area, the Bay of Aguadilla is in process right now to soon be a marine protected area. And we're also excited about this initiative. And I encourage again, all of you as young people to go out, spread the word, um, share your local initiatives um, because you never know who your share might get to and um, to just spread the word and create awareness about what's happening all around in your local communities. Here's some of the organizations that have helped me come across so far. Um, there's Surf Rider Foundation, Airfeco International, and the National Ocean Protection Coalition. And um, I encourage you all to follow these and your other organizations that you might be interested in. And if anyone has any questions. Oh, there are tons of good questions, but thank you so much, Claudia, for that. I think what's really, what my favorite part of your presentation was is that it felt so doable. Like obviously establishing a marine protected area, that's a big lift. Um, but sort of your journey feels really um, like it can be easily replicated. Um, and I know that we have a couple of questions in here um, about that. But before we get started um, with questions, please, if you guys have any questions, these three are, as you can tell, a wealth of knowledge. Um, they're also young people like yourselves who are just learning and trying to make it happen. So no big or no two small questions can be asked. Um, but something that I wanted to ask all three of you and get your perspective on, what was something along this journey that either you didn't expect it to be so hard or on the flip side, you didn't expect it to be so easy? You know, so what is something, you know, barriers um, that actually were really easy to get over or things that you weren't expecting to be kind of really difficult and um, that you didn't anticipate? Um, and all three of you can answer, but it's up to you who wants to start first. You're all thinking like the good. Um, yeah, go ahead, Claudia. Yeah, so I think that a big barrier that um, we've been facing is the different types of thinking of the different types of sectors of the community. So maybe we are thrilled to open this new market protected area, but maybe the fishermen of this area will be mad about this initiative. So I think that definitely an educational um, barrier is um, something that's very constant. And um, I think that this, this has been a challenge, but I think that if we all come together, um, we could definitely come to an agreement of how to do this new marine protected area. Um, so that everyone is happy with the initiative. But yeah, the different ways of thinking of the different um, community sectors are something that will always like have an impact. Yeah, that I, is so difficult. You know, yes. what's at the root of all, all of this is collaboration and connecting, um, but trying to incorporate all of the voices. Yeah, like you said, Claudia, to make everyone happy, but not only happy, but seen, heard. Yeah. Um, I know there was a question in the comment about, you know, the economy of um, a lot of these areas people rely on um, uh, for jobs. And it's, how do we, how do we bring all that together and find a solution? Because there is one, there is a solution that makes everyone happy, but you know, how much work do we have to do to make, make sure that that happens? Thank you for bringing that up. That's such an important um, um, factor and can, yeah, be a barrier, especially if you get too far in the project and, you know, haven't done that sort of legwork um, to, to hear opinions and sides. Olivia and Dorlin, do you guys have anything? Either it was unexpected, unexpectedly easy about this or unexpectedly really hard. Um, one of the biggest barriers that our team went through this year was getting in touch with senators from Michigan or either like, cause we did, we already had contacts with Senator Tom Bennett in Illinois and he got us contacts with uh, Senator John Cherry and Ed McBroom. 
and we contacted them or but sometimes they just wouldn't get back to us or they would say that they are so busy which is understandable or that they just they like didn't see this project as going anywhere so it was like a it was kind of difficult to try to convince multiple senators that we are serious and that we like actually want to get and that this is this has been passed before and it can be again it's just um it was a little bit more difficult considering that it's coming from a, a bunch of high school kids too so i think that that was one of the biggest challenges that we faced but we did eventually get in touch with many other great senators who do believe in us and have helped us and we are going to eventually pass it soon this actually answers one of the questions and then we'll get to you, Olivia. This actually answers one of the um, questions in the chat from Kaya. Also, I so apologize if I mispronounce your name. Um, if I do, put in the chat how I should pronounce it. Um, but this is from Kaya. How, what was that process of reaching out? Did you cold email? Um, you kind of spoke, Dorlin, to asking your own representatives and legislators to connect you. What was that process like um, of actually reaching out getting meetings like to walk us through like the physical like doing of that um so the first things that we did were finding the senator the list of senators that we thought could potentially like help us or that would be on our team and then we would find there well i mean mr ritter would like have he has so many contacts so he kind of just figured out how to either get their email or a phone number and then he would have a phone call with them but most of the time it was just me and my teammates Megan and Caitlin Hamilton Caitlin Hamilton and Megan Hankel we would email them uh, from our school emails and we would um, reach out to them saying this is who we are this is what we're doing we hope that you can help and then it would either just end there and we would hear nothing back or if we did which was awesome we would um it, it would start a conversation to where we could either move on to having a per, like a in face or not not in person but like kind of like this like a zoom meeting where we could see each other face to face and we could talk it over and that eventually led to yes we can do this or i uh, don't have we don't have sufficient time or things like that but most of the time it was just um, a lot of emails. We didn't really get to the point of having a Zoom meeting until we met with Senator Sue Shank and Sydney Hart. Uh, and then they talked to us and then we have continued emailing back and forth to see when our next meetings are gonna be. And it's just, it's kind of this back and forth just between email. Email guys, email. <laughs> Um, it can really sometimes be that simple. I think a, a really important um, fact that Dora Lynn pulled out was already doing your research to see, you know, who your legislators are, what they care about, what issues they have voted on in the past, and kind of bridging connections that way. That isn't to say only reach out to um, legislators who have um, historically uh, voted positively on environmental matters who have passed environmental issues. Um, something that the girls are both really proud of is that on the conservation, on the 30 by 30 task force he here in Illinois, it's bipartisan. Um, so they're both um, Democrats and Republicans serving, both conservative and liberal um, uh, legislators serving on that council and committee. So yeah, really just understanding who these people are, what they care about, um, looking at who your legislators are, because they need to listen to you, you're going to vote or not vote for them. Um, figuring out who those folks are getting into contact and then figuring it out from there via email. Um, it's not always that easy. Um, writing postcards, writing letters can also work making phone calls. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of this information, like Laura said, um, you know, how to get in contact with them is online. So that's here in the United States. I'm guarantee it's different depending on where you come from, but look into it or ask, um, ask uh, adults, ask um, people you trust. Um, I'm sure they, they would have that information. Um, going into, Olivia, do you want to add anything? We kind of steered off and um, 
asked one of the questions in the chat, but did you want to add anything, both something that was unexpectedly easy or unexpectedly difficult about this journey? Yes. Um, something I, I'm going to go kind of in the other direction from Dorlin and talk about something that was a little easier for me that I really anticipated was going to be difficult um, was going into those meetings and being taken seriously. Um, a lot of the people that the, the the students that I had inherited this project from were um, coming at the project from a perspective of they were lovers of science. They I think they went on a two or three of them went on to study like environmental communications or environmental science. And I was like, I'm the most like liberal arts, goofy like person. I don't think if you met me isolated from this project, you would expect me to be involved in this. So the imposter syndrome was real. Um, and I, I, it, it was very scary. Um, I didn't feel like I was going to be taken seriously when they asked, what are you looking to do after this? And it wasn't going to be, I'm going to go be a scientist. Um, but I found that actually to be a little bit of an advantage, um, cause I could come at things from a, a different perspective. And, um, I felt that need to always need to prove myself in those environments. Um, and I, that made me, I think, work harder. And so then when I went into these big conversations, um, I was always, you know, trying to get them to listen to me and then it was working. Um, and I didn't anticipate that at all. I thought I was going to have to really fight and I did, but it was the fact that that fighting worked out. Um, and that, that made me click the red button on zoom and just like sigh of relief every single time. Um, it, it was it was an incredible feeling, but it was very scary. And um, if I can speak to anybody who kind of feels like that in starting a project that they aren't the the right fit or the like the right character, um, work hard and have have the um, have have the evidence and the documents and everything you need. Make sure you're prepared, and then you know hit the ground running. You don't have time to feel insecure, even though you do. Just compartmentalize and keep going. I love that. It, it reminds me of a story that Laura tells about like meeting with meeting in Washington, DC with like pink hair, like purple hair. Um, we get this question a lot, actually um, doing these where a lot of young people are like, I have green hair and piercings and I'm covered in tattoos, but I care about this issue and I'm worried people won't take me seriously. And, you know, Olivia, you speaking to that, like, I think it's so important that you all show up exactly how you are because that's where you care. Your authentic self is where that love for our planet and its people come from. And so you showing up exactly as you are is so critical to the fight um, because we need more visibility of um, different bodied humans um, because they are so important and then they matter and it encourages even more young people to get involved um, and not feel, yeah, not feel insecure and not feel like, oh, I won't be taken seriously. It's like, actually, yeah, I can, I should, because I'm a human and I'm inheriting this earth and therefore you have to listen to me. <laughs> like, I love that. I love that that keeps coming up in our, in our conversations. Um, you guys have so many good questions. Thank you, Claudia, for answering um, some of these in the chat. Um, one, let's, I kind of want to connect a couple and um, point this question over to you, Claudia. Um, there's two questions, one from our pal Kaya again, whose name I pronounced correctly, Wu. Um, uh, Kaya's question is, how often do you complete inventories of the bay? And then um, tackling onto that, um, Hamishi or Hamishi um, wants to know how do you connect with local um, people, especially fishers. You know, people along that, that um, you know, along the coast, along the bay, who are um, you know either relying for that, relying on that area for their job. Um, how do you get in contact with those people? So yeah, two questions: How often do you complete these inventories? Um, and you know, how do you get in contact when you're working on that? Um, you know, the people, the the community stakeholders like fishers, fishermen and fisherwomen. Yeah, um, so for the inventory question, um, we often go um, do a round of dives on the different areas of the bay. Um, for example, for this survey, um, we did three areas. 
of the Bay of Aguadilla um, that are the most um, important ones. And so we collected um, up data on those areas about the species that live here. So we did that um, for like two months. We did like six dives and it was like a, a bi-weekly dives. So like six dives were made of inventory and we are planning actually to go back and collect some more data. Um, but it usually is like um, two or three dives per month. And about the other question, what was it again? How do you get into contact with um, like community stakeholders? Yes. Um, so the organization that we're currently working with that's coming up with this beautiful initiative of um, transforming this area into a protected one is Surf Rider and other locals. Um, so these people live in this area and are in contact with um, the main fisher people of these areas. Um, so they can contact them and they're planning on soon. Um, so first of all, um, a documental, educational um, documental about this area was released recently. Um, so that was the first step um, to the, educate the community beforehand so that they know the importance of this area. And so we have been waiting for that to happen. Um, now the next step is actually communicating with the different sectors. Um, so these organizations contacted the fishermen or um, everything, um, every sector of the community that they know so that the, the word can be spread. Also, it's going to be shared through so social media. Um, so that's also a great way to contact people. And um, yeah, we are just going to reunite with the different sectors of the community, um, including fishermen, so that um, they can get a better understanding of how can we come to an agreement. And keeping on that, something that um, I think is a misconception around around marine protected areas is this idea of you know where will those jobs go um so this is a question from frank um is there any compensation or alternative job to those who were depending on this area to earn their living um is that something that you guys talk about if not there is wonderful resources out there that explain that process but i didn't know from your perspective if you had an answer to that claudia yes um so i'm not sure about the compensation but as for this marine protected area that's going to be created, it's not going to be a no-take zone. Um, a no-take zone means that in this area, you cannot take at all any type of species or fishes. So this area is going to be more of a community-led um, area so that the community can protect it um, by themselves um, and the different members um, can protect it. But it's, um, for my understanding, not gonna be a no-take zone. So we don't wanna take away those rights from the fishermen and we want them to keep um, making this uh, as their main source of income, just that we want to also um, protect this area. And we also want the help from fishermen to protect this area. Yeah, as I mean, speaking about the um, the fishing community, these people are seeing the changes in in their, um, their work as um, fishing stock is being driven out or uh, being polluted. And I mean, just look at the sedimentation photos. I mean, um, people who use this and um, rely on these areas for their um, jobs um, sustainably as a lot of um, local um, uh, fish people do, um, they want to keep this protected as well, right? They want their these areas to be clean and um, and preserved. And, and so thank you for that, Claudia, um, for answering yeah. that. Um, as I think that's a part that gets kind of lost in the conversation, but is so important in understanding yeah. um, what it means to protect like areas um, physically where people rely on them um, for their occupation. Um, yes, and so, yeah, oh, sorry. No, keep going. Yeah, uh, yeah no, um, just on a side note, um, also, most of these people have an understanding about how things work and that the spawning seasons are so important so that um, they, I'm sure that it will go perfectly because um, they all know that we need to protect this area so that they can keep getting that income. Yeah, I love that. Finishing us out, I want to combine two questions, one from Matt in the chat and one from Mary in the Q&A box. Um, and this is for Olivia and Dora Lynn. Um, and then 
maybe Claudia, if you have a suggestion and answer, we'd love to get your opinion at the end, but sort of combining these, um, this first one is from Mary, um, which is really the foundation I think of starting any conservation project is how do you find more dedicated people around you to form, you know, your teams, your conservation project team, teammates as this can be really isolating work and it's so critical to have people like-minded people around you. And then the suck, sort of second part to that is, um, you know, if you are a high school student who wants to get into helping the environment, you have your team, right? Where do you start? Where do you go? Where do you, you funnel that energy? So two part question, um, feel free to start however you'd like either with Olivia or Dorlin. Um, I'll start. So in finding that team, um, if you're, frankly, if you're here in this call, if you're already having this interest, you're probably going to be the one who's going to, you know, wrap, rope that team in together. So um, how I did it and how I got involved was, um, it, it was kind of a trickle down effect. So I saw, I just watched other people doing what they did on their own. Um, and that sparked my interest. And so then I started to um, take that and run with it in my own direction. And that made other people, you know, that put eyes on me, that got other people seeing what I was doing. It sparked that interest naturally. Um, so if you, you just need to understand that you are who you are, your beliefs are your beliefs, and people are going to learn from that. Um, if you kind of get stuck, um, just go to the internet, find um, eco influencers, see what they're talking about, see what of that you latch on to, do what you can. And a lot of times you start it, you have no resources, you know, you, you know, you don't have a lot. And a lot of times that means digital media. And um, honestly, I started out um, when I was a sophomore in high school and, uh, you know, reposting things to my Snapchat story and onto my Instagram story. And then people were having conversations with me. I didn't know you cared about this. What is this about? I, you become a pseudo expert in your little circle and then other people will latch onto that and that will take you so far. I also want to say that um, in, uh, in um, creating that group and starting a, a project and making larger connections, um, it's, you, you just want to start with whatever is a reflection of the community that you're from. So we talked about this a little bit with Pontiac that um, Illinois is a very agricultural state. So we came at it from an agricultural perspective. If you're from a urban area, you might not have a lot of space to work with. So you got to get more creative and look at um, pollution arguments. You look at the problem that's where you are. Um, I, um, with, with the resources I have, it's not going to be the best um, the, the most beneficial for me to look at um, something, an issue that's primarily existing out of California or New York. That's not where I'm from. That's not um, the connections I'm going to make. But if you can make the connection to where you are, there's a group of students in Pontiac who saw that a lot of people wanted a food forest and now they are working to make that food forest. And that is incredible. And it's serving a need. It's filling that need. So find those needs, find those niches, and you will create a little community that will um, create some great things later on. I love anything to add to that, Dorlin? Uh, yeah, um, I do agree with what Olivia said about finding the, the like people who are interested in interested in protecting the environment as well, because I do remember being a freshman and like seeing all of the people in, um, Mr. Ritter's environmental earth science class, like doing all these great things and like seeing how they accomplished it. And I just thought that that was so interesting. And then, cause when I was, um, when I was a freshman, my sister, oh, my older sister was in his class as well. And she was in charge of a project called the Trash Blitz Project. And she kind of uh, invited me to help clean and pick, um, like clean our community and pick up trash that we saw. And then we uh, recorded it into this, database and then to see what was polluting our community the most which I thought was really cool and then she so that kind of introduced me to the class along with becoming friends with Olivia all throughout high school uh, I saw the things that she did she's such a big inspiration 
I love you, Olivia. Anyway, um, so I saw the things that she did with the 30 by 30 task force, and that really inspired me to take that on myself. And I kind of got involved with my teammates now, um, again, Megan and Caitlin, who are so, they have just as much passion for it as I did uh, going into it. And now that we have kind of like, we're kind of nearing our end, I mean, we're still gonna help out obviously, but like nearing our end in the actual class, it's kind of sad, but we look over all the accomplishments that we have made. We're so incredibly proud of that. Um, just so that's how kind of how I started out in high school, but I understand that a lot of high schools do not have the same opportunities as Pontiac to have an environmental or science class, um, even though it can be so beneficial. But um, I think Claudia mentioned it earlier that uh, a great way to just start out your environmental journey is to look at the local organizations that you can follow, look at the people who are already doing big things in your community, start small and then follow them and kind of expand on that to create your own project and your own, have your own motives and with your own team and everything like that. So I just think that a lot of great points were made in this, in this uh, meeting and I really enjoyed it. I think like my favorite, favorite example. So Olivia, a fun fact about her. So the very first iteration of the advocacy training was a webinar series that I hosted called Rise Up Webinar. Um, and it was right when the pandemic started, we weren't sure you know, what online communication was gonna look like. And Olivia was on every single Rise Up Webinar that I ever hosted, watching, communicating in the chat, meeting people. We're talking like 2020, we don't know what's happening, like meeting people online. And I took notice of, of that as a host. And so I connected with her in person when we were able to. And now look, right now she's on this talking about a conservation project that she led. Like, it's really, guys, I think we underestimate how important it is to just meet with people, see the people that you think are doing really cool work, check out what they're doing, be on their webinars. They will notice you. Um, especially if you come from a similar background, you're in the same community. Um, we need more young people like you. You know, the older I get, the more I'm looking for the next up and coming conservation superstars. I'm not alone in that. You know, the Ocean Project does that as well with the World Ocean Day Youth Advisory Council every year looking for, you know, who's doing the work, who's leading the charge and, you know, bringing them to get together to connect. And webinars like this are a perfect example and a perfect way to meet new people build that community if you don't have it physically um, and brainstorm really cool ways to make a difference together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of your incredible questions. This is by far one of my favorite that we've done um, just because I think what is like the coolest thing is seeing where you all are coming, coming from and um, knowing that you're doing this work, right? Um, talk about like an optimism boost. Like I needed that today. So thank you for all of your work. Thank you for being here. Um, we hope we see you at the next one. Um, Laura, give us a little hint at what, what we're seeing next Saturday. Yes. So if you enjoyed this last little section of the Q&A that I found so inspiring, um, you will definitely appreciate our session two next Saturday on the 6th of May at 1 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Uh, Universal Standard Time. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, effective campaign organizing and figuring out how to kind of funnel your interests and the things that you're good at and the things that you're passionate about into action. Um, and I really hope that you guys are able to join us. So I'm just going to really quick drop that registration link in the chat to make sure you're registered for session two. Um, we weren't able to get to all of your questions in the Q&A, but that's okay because sessions two, three, and four all have to do with some of the questions that were asked. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. I also wanted to um, say happy birthday again to Claudia. Um, happy birthday. <laughs> and so uh, to, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, and to make sure everybody check out our World Ocean Day resources. Um, World Ocean Day is on June 8th coming up very, very fast. And we have a couple of really helpful toolkits out to help um, turn events into uh, really 
awesome conservation action focused event. Um, so definitely check that out. And once again, thank you all for joining us. It was incredible to have all of our panelists, incredible young people from two different regions, very different um, case studies, but such similar passions and such similar um, dedication to the cause. It's just really awesome to see. So um, with that being said, thank you all so much. Thank you, Bailey, for joining us again, and uh, hope to see you again next weekend, everyone. Bye, everyone. See you next weekend. Oops. And uh, there we go. Bye, everyone. <laughs>